Um, how many of you have used frequency separation before? Just out of curiosity. Simple yes or no. Just curious. Bean says never. Couple say yes. No, 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 no. Sometimes no, 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 nope. No, yes. Wow. Lots of no's. It intimidates me. Good. That That's what we're here to solve. New user for all. Cool. Okay. Lots of no's. Actually, a few more yeses than I was expecting, to be honest. I was kind of expecting people to be unfamiliar with it or completely unfamiliar with it. Um, but yeah, that's not the case. Welcome, Bob, to ACDC. Um, yeah, awesome. Why don't we get started? Um, so we'll, we'll just begin by talking about the repair tools, and then we'll, we'll talk about frequency separation as well, because they're uh, really linked to how I use frequency separation. Actually, you know what? Let's break this down a little bit differently. Let's describe frequency separation. We'll talk about the repair tools individually, and then we'll come back and sort of illustrate how you use those tools with frequency separation. Because I think that would make the most sense. Yeah, I think that's that makes the most sense to me. Um, we'll just give an example. So this is an image I found. So a lot of the photos that you want to do frequency separation on are in general, you want to do repairs uh, are ones that are damaged, right? Um, that's not always the case. Uh, a good example that Alec uh, Watson used to talk about was stray hairs. Uh, not necessarily a damaged photo, but sometimes you'll get a hair over top of the cheek or the forehead on your image and it will um, disrupt the sort of appearance of the of what you're going for. And so it's typical to use repair tools to remove that, right? And in ACDC, we have a variety of repair tools. But basically, you have the ability to clone uh, using another part of your image. Uh, you have the ability to heal, which is sort of like a blending tool. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about these all individually as we go through. Then you have the ability to uh, use something called Smart Erase. And what Smart Erase does is it basically looks at the pixels in your image and averages uh, uh, pixels uh, around uh, where you've selected and replaces the information that you've selected with the pixels around it. Um, yes, I can try. Uh, and then the final tool is um, something called Blended Clone. And what blended clone is, is it's a combination of heal and clone tool. And so that gives you the ability to uh, sort of clone something while also uh, blending it in basically at the same time. So these are the four um, repair tools that we'll be talking about today. How does that work with frequency separation? So frequency separation is a way of partitioning or separating your image into something called a low pass filter and a high pass filter. And it's really powerful. And I'll just illustrate what it looks like. And keep in mind that I'm going to be going over all of this in more depth as we go through, but this is sort of just a primer at the beginning. Frequency separation, what it does is it separates your image to something called a low pass filter and a high pass filter. Right now we're looking at a high pass filter. What a high pass filter is, is it basically makes a representation of your image uh, that focuses more on texture details through contrast. Whereas a low pass filter, as you can see here, focuses more on brightness values. And so it showcases in this case, the color in quotation marks, because this is a black and white image. But ultimately what I mean by that is the degrees of saturation and change in saturation. And then in the high pass filter presents to you sort of like textural detail, right? Uh, no, uh, well, all of the repair tools are, but the frequency separation is not. Peter, good question. So when we apply a uh, frequency separation to our image, um, what we're doing is we're splitting our image into two qualities. Uh, so as you can see, when I went to go apply that frequency separation, and again, I'll be showcasing all of this again, I have uh, essentially my high pass layer right here on top. And then I have my low pass layer, which contains the sort of um, blurry kind of uh, brightness values versus the textural uh, sort of contrast values here. Um, and this is really useful 
when it comes to repairing images because what they do is they isolate different components of your image. They give you the ability to work on texture individually and the ability to um, uh, work on sort of uh, uh, these sort of general uh, degrees of saturation in your image, the sort of brightness values of your image. And uh, in color images, these would be obviously in color. So, um, so what it's going to do is it's going to separate the sort of color saturated components in your image to that of your sort of textural um, detail oriented components. And I'll show this once more with a color photo actually, because I think it'll better represent what I'm trying to showcase. It doesn't matter what image I go into. We'll just go into this image of a hamburger. But if I do this, um, yeah, I, I'll go over the how to get frequency separation open again. So frequency separation is located on the layer itself, uh, Bill and Peter. What you would do is you would right click on the layer and you'd click on frequency separation. And it also has a keyword of control shift F. And so when you do that, it'll open up a little window. And what this window asks you to do is basically determine the degree of blur that you see on your high pass and low pass layers. I typically just use the default settings. But as you can see here, something that you'll notice on this color image, right? is when I apply a frequency separation and after I cl click OK, what it does is it presents me those two layers that I was thinking about in the frequency separation menu. Excuse me. It shows me the layer that contains the quote unquote texture or detail, the sort of areas of high contrast, especially where, where there's grain detail. And then it shows me the areas of color uh, and it almost feels like it's been blurred and that texture has been removed from it, right? But the cool thing about frequency separation is it sort of applies these two things. You can see that our top layer here has a blending of linear light, which when put together represents our original image. It's just been split into two, our uh, sort of low pass layer and our high pass layer with our high pass layer being blended over top of our low pass layer. So this is really powerful. Okay, pause. How does this relate to... Um, uh, how does this relate to um, refining our image or repairing our image? What we do is we typically have a lot of grainy details like noise, water damage, stray hairs, um, even something like cracks in an image, right? Especially if they're older images. These are common, right? These are things you can get rid of um, in our high pass layer. And sometimes further details will needed to be adjusted in our low pass layer. Now, you might ask, why don't we just repair the whole image? And for a lot of your images, that'll be just fine. You can just repair your image combined with those two values. However, in some images, using frequency separation gives you so much incremental control over your repairing uh, of your images and reduces or completely removes in some cases, uh, basically just issues that you may come up during your repairing process. So it's sort of like a way to increase um, your, uh, uh, get a better outcome on your image with less risk. Um, yeah, so Alex mentioned, I encounter a lot of cracks and poor repairs working with glass plate negatives from 100 years ago. So if you're digitizing these, and this is sort of why I focus on older images, you might find, you probably already use frequency separation to some degree, Alex, but what you might find is that it's going to be able to better assist you with some of those high frequency issues. So what I mean by that is the textural elements of your image, like you were describing about the cracking. These are things that you can sort of address in the high pass layer, the layer that contains the texture and the detail in your image without actually uh, interrupting or uh, engaging with the sort of broad color, the themes in your image. So Peter asked a good question. I'll navigate back to my previous image and then we'll start talking about the repair process in more depth. So what Peter asked was how, uh, how is the default settings chosen? I actually don't know. 
Um, I don't know how they're chosen necessarily, but I know that you can have, um, you have control over sort of the degree, in which case let's show you what that looks like. So again, I've just opened up my image. <laughs> this is a fun image because it shows how um, this piece of tape has been applied over top of the image. Like it looks like a clear piece of tape in order to bring these two images together because it looks like it was broken or separated or split in half, right? And just to illustrate what I've been doing to this image, I'm not gonna complete this in the workshop, but just to sort of illustrate the power of frequency separation, as you can see, I've slowly gone in and I've started to repair this image and get rid of the like line in the image and along with the tape around the edges of it. Can everybody see that? Um, a lot of the work that was done to this image was done on the layer that contained the texture element or the detail in this case. And I'm gonna illustrate what that looks like. So uh, uh, was it Peter? Peter asked earlier, how is the default settings chosen? So I'll right click and click on frequency separation. And as you can see, uh, this is our default. So I don't know how the algorithm works for this. I don't know how this works exactly. I just know that in this case, you have, like I, I said earlier, two layers, a high frequency and a low frequency layer. But you'll notice that as I increase the blur in my image, oops, there we go. You can see that it'll change the relationship of the texture in our image here. And as you can see here, the blur will be dramatically increased in the low pass layer. So there's generally a comfortable dynamic that you want to fit here um, because we don't wanna lose too much of the um, overall context in the low pass layer. We're just gonna lose too much detail to it. So I think finding a, uh, maybe going with a lower value is gonna enable us to split our image better uh, into this quote unquote, and again, I'm really using this uh, as colloquially as possible, but texture elements versus sort of our overall element here. Actually, this is interesting because at a blur radius of 16, which isn't default, I believe 22 is default, but you can see in our low pass layer here, the colors that are represented in that piece of tape are actually still visible in the low pass layer. So to me, this wouldn't be a significant enough of a blur. I would wanna to go to something like maybe 21 or 22, where we start to see that a little bit less. Anyway, with that complete, it now gives me the ability to work on these layers individually. Okay, we'll come back to frequency separation because we're gonna use it to make some of our repair changes. But let's take a pause here to actually talk about repairing and sort of what methods we wanna use in terms of repairing. And I'm gonna start with this one because I think this represents a good example of something that you'd come across where you would wanna do a spot repairs to this image. So you might notice by looking at this image that this image has um, essentially dust marks on it. Uh, and these dust marks were captured as, in essence during the digitizing process which is very normal. This is probably an image that either had dust on the lens when the photo was being taken, or uh, this dust appeared in sort of like the actual film copy of the, the photo. Yeah, they are. I got these from Flickr, uh, Jayant. So this is actually a cool resource. We might as well talk about this as well. Just give me a sec. Um, here we go. So if I go to Flickr, there's a really cool tool or section on Flickr where you can just look up an image. I'll just look up old image. Um, as soon as you actually search for an image on Flickr, it'll bring up this uh, ability for you to open up. Um, again, I'll, I'll go over those, Peter. I will be going over those. I'm just sort of, that was just a primer to frequency separation. I haven't yet really broken it down. Um, on Flickr, you can go to a section called the commons. And what the commons is, is it's a series of um, what, uh, basically museums all across the world that uh, upload um, historical images that have either been, um, that have been acquired by the, the museums themselves or are um, in this case, uh, essentially um, public domain images. And so as public domain images, um, they're sort of free for all use, which is really cool. 
And so I get a lot of my older photos from this section. There's some really beautiful contemporary images too, I think. Um, but most of this image imagery comes from the early 20th century, which is, I think, a really good resource, especially if you're looking, if you just want to look at cool old photos, <laughs> which I often do. Um, yeah. So I have my image here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it into the repair tool. Now, something to keep in mind when repairing our images is uh, if we were to finalize our repairs and say we fixed our image and we're happy with it, um, that's great. Uh, that's We're going to want to save down that image either as a um, an editable file, so a an ACDC file, a file that we can go into in the future, basically, and make changes to if we want to. Um, or we'll just save it as a JPEG because we intend to um, compress the file and never edit it again, right? The one thing to keep in mind is that if we are going to save our image as an ACDC file, it might be in our best interest to duplicate our image. And why we would do this is because we want to keep a essentially original within the file. So I can go and I can change, right click on this layer and rename it to a uh, sort of edited file or edited image, right? And then we have our original that is stored within the file that we're gonna be working off of. The benefit of this is that we can work on basically edit our edited image within this overall file. And then we can refer back to our original if we've made any mistakes or if we want to edit something in the future. One of the things I always mention is that when you're working in edit mode in ACDC, all of these tools in relation to the layer panel that you see on the right-hand side here, so the actions that make selections, the layers themselves with blending and opacity, right? In addition to the adjustment layers, and masking, all of these tools on the right-hand side, which much of this we won't be covering in this workshop, but a good thing to note is that they are non-destructive, right? Versus the filter menu with specifically the repair tool, which is what we're gonna be focusing on today. These filter menu items are all destructive. And destructive tools um, basically can't be re-edited in the future. Um, it means that you can't go back and you can't change incremental things like, oh, I really like my image, but I want that spec to be uh, to reappear now that I've removed it. And unfortunately, when we've worked with the filter menu, we can't do that. So we create a duplicate of our original just so that we have that original to work from if we need to, to create new changes to our image. So filter menu, destructive, uh, essentially layer menu on the right here, non-destructive. Again, all within the context of this being saved as an editable file. So like an ACDC file. We'll talk about that in a sec in a bit more depth. But the point, important thing is I have an edited image here, a duplication of my original image. And just uh, again, you can duplicate from this little button right here. I'm gonna open this edited image in the repair tool and we'll talk about each individual tool and sort of how I'd go about quickly repairing this image. This is a really um, simple repair um, job on this, on this image. So when I open repair, it brings me into this temporary window and uh, as do all filters actually. And from here, what we're gonna do is we're going to adjust my image and we're going to um, in essence, we're going to uh, get rid of these little spots on my image. So let's talk about each tool just quickly, because again, this is a so somewhat of an introductory um, workshop focusing on these different heal and clone tools in addition to frequency separation. So we'll talk about heal first. I like to think of heal as a uh, as sort of like a, a blending tool. Am I cutting out for everybody? Is everyone having struggles with me? Uh, hearing me? I just got Carolyn mentioning that I'm cutting out. Okay, that might be an internet issue. Okay, as long as we're good. If I do start to cut out, let me know. That might have just been a um, an internet uh, issue on my uh, my end. Okay, okay. 
Um, let me see if I can just turn up my microphone too a little bit. I just oh the gain is maxed on it. Maybe I can do this slightly. There we go. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, if there's any issues, let me know. Yeah, when I if I ever turn away from the mic, yeah, it'll you'll, you'll um you'll hear that. The mic has a is like a is a directional microphone. It's not like a headset or something. So I think it was just because I I might have been looking down at the moment. Okay, so the heel tool does this. Basically, with these tools, what with the exception of Smart Erase, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a point of reference. When you set a point of reference, you're gonna see this little blue circle that pops up. And the way we set a point of reference is by using the right click on our mouse. And then when we hover over a new portion of my image, I can use that point of reference to sort of replace the contents. And so things we're looking for, for example, in this area right here, we're looking for areas that contain similar colors and pixel values. So um, we want to uh, make application changes uh, based on the qualities of the pixels that are surround our area of interest. Um, and this is important uh, because obviously uh, pixels that are further away from our target are going to be more dissimilar from pixels that are nearby. So it's kind of like a classic rule of um, spatial rule when it comes to images, right? In essence, this pixel that's over here, I wouldn't want to set as a reference for something fixing up here, right? It's going to leave this grainy, ugly thing that um, that doesn't quite represent the area. So what I'll want to do is use something that's nearby as a reference point. This is sort of how we go through the process of healing an image. The same is even more true for clone. Um, okay, so cloning literally is stamp making. So as you can see here, there's this little black dot, right? Um, if I go to use this as a reference, it's going to directly create a clone representation that pops here. And that's not going to work for me, right? You want to pull from something that's directly nearby. Now you might notice that that cloning that I did leaves a little bit of a stamp image. It might be hard to see from a recording perspective, but it's gonna leave a little bit of a residue around the, the nib that we select. And the reason why is because this is a direct application from, uh, from the point of reference to the area that we're um, going to be targeting, right? So clone is very powerful, heal is very powerful, but they all have their weaknesses. I find that heal um, <clears throat> often um, is uh, not strong enough of, a, of an effect for the area that I'm, I'm looking at. Whereas clone is too strong of an effect and obviously leaves uh, some forms of uh, like residue around the edge of the nib. Now, um, you can, you can, you can go over uh, anything you've, you've created here, Bob, that's a good point. So if I was to go in and uh, create an application here, right? A cloning, you can see that the colors don't quite match. Um, you can increase the feathering for sure. Um, but the things you can do is you can also go in and like you're saying, and sort of heal around the edge of it. I find, um, no, if you, you're you using the clone tool and it has a higher feathering, it's not gonna have that same effect, right? Because what it's gonna do is it's gonna go through and it'll sort of justify the edge of it based on a sort of a gradation of the color that you're stamping from. That's a good way to do it for sure. Um, with the more recent versions of the product, we've added something called blended clone, which I think is a more surefire way of sort of going through and stamp adjusting these images because it blends um, literally and figuratively heal and clone as a tool together. And sort of, it sort of represents a really fast and efficient way to take uh, stamps of your image and then utilize them and they are sort of, uh, in this case, blended in the area that surrounds them. So I can just go through and create these stamps. And it does the healing process in addition to the uh, stamping process. So that's a really fast way to go through and remove these 
uh, issues. I'm not saying that you can't use a uh, clone and heal. It just, you might find better results with this, at least starting out. So I'm just going to go through and I'm going to remove as many of these dots as I can see. We'll come back to certain other elements with different tools. This one's interesting. I think this one might be a good candidate for this. Mm. Actually, that's not bad. How is heal different from blended clone? Um, so heal uh, sort of does a, um, is a much softer uh, effect, whereas blended clone will copy an element in the sort of very center of the, uh, the, the nib and it'll apply a healing around it. Uh, so it's sort of like a combination of both heal and clone as a tool. Um, again, so the, I, I personally use blended clone a lot in conjunction with images like these uh, because it sort of replicates a, a really good use scenario of both heal and clone as tools. Um, these are not to say that you might find a tool more effective than the other. I'm really not suggesting that you only use one tool. I'm just sort of going through and showcasing how I'm using them for this one image. Um, really play around with all of them. Uh, there might be situations where you'll also want to apply a smart erase because cloning doesn't necessarily work very well. Here's an issue where, let's see, if I was to blended clone, it's going to create this blur pattern here, right? So this clearly doesn't work very well. Um, whereas uh, if I was to create a clone, right, with high feathering, let's say I create a clone of this area, you can see that I can clone it. However, the problem is it, it keeps the direction of the stamp of the area that I've stamped. This might be a good candidate for something like Smart Erase. Uh, let me plot, try a different couple applications. Sometimes it's easier when you go closer in. Yeah, that's a bit better. Even if it's a slight angle, it's still... Um, it's still better than that area. It looks justified within the space. So where Smart Erase, what it does is you can undo with just Control Z actually, um, Susan, or you can use these undo panels on the bottom left-hand corner. So you can do a Control Z or you can just use those. So in this case, Smart Erase is gonna work very different from the other three. So on one hand, you have, uh, pardon me, you have healing, which sort of creates a, uh, like a very subtle stamp over top of the uh, air image. You might see certain elements come through still, whereas clone is a direct uh, stamp. In this case, it's gonna copy the exact pixels of the area and apply those exact pixels with an exception to the area that is feathered. Um, Blended clone is going to do a combination of those two effects where it's going to heal the area by sort of a very subtle application, but it's still going to copy elements from the target location. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to that too. Uh, and then smart erase is truly copying um, the area of an image and applying um, sort of like a uh, an adjustment uh, based on uh, pixels that are nearby. So are not contained within the area that you're selecting. I'm going to see how this looks. Again, some of these two are just a matter of playing around with different tools, but I'm just going to see how it handles this situation. Yeah, pretty good. Um, still maintaining the curvature of the chin here, was able to get rid of that element. Certain ones might make more sense to use Smart Erase than others. This, let's try to get rid of this and see what happens. Mm, I don't like that. So this one might be a better subject for a clone. Yep. Going through, and as you can see, I can make these adjustments subtly throughout my image here. Um, okay, let's talk about something different now. Um, I can go through and obviously continue to edit the rest of my image, but this is just to sort of showcase these functions. Um, let's talk about two different situations with frequency separation. Let's add frequency separation to the conversation now. If I go to um, 
let's go to our another image here. So in this image, my subject has a lot of, um, yeah, actually it's more like dust part particles, or it looks like it might even be scratches on the surface of my image here. And these are all very textural components. Uh, they're not so much areas where there's going to be a lot of variation in a sort of, um, in this case, I'm going to say the word color, but really what we mean is brightness and saturation here. So this would be a good subject for frequency separation, specifically the high pass mode. So why don't we talk about what this would look like to fix here? First of all, can everybody see those little wiry sort of white specks all over my image here? I just wanna make sure that that's clear to everyone. Okay, if those are clear, let's go through the process of frequency separation and sort of remove them. Um, I find these to be uh, fairly common actually in older images. Lots of little specks, as Paul said. So first thing I'm gonna do, uh, just because in this hypothetical scenario, I'd be saving this as an ACDC file. I'm planning to edit this image in the future maybe. I'm gonna create a duplicate. And then we'll just rename these again. So I'm gonna go uh, edits. And I'll call this one the original. And let's go in and let's make a frequency separation of the edits. So I'll right click my image, go to frequency separation, and it will separate my image into high pass and low pass layers with a blur radius of approximately 21. Have a look at both, maybe increase the blur by a couple. Yeah, that's better. We'll go with that, 26. Apply. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna hide my original layer. Uh, I don't wanna see it. And then we'll let's have a look at sort of how this application adjusted my image. So we have the blur, right? So if you look at this blur, you can see that there's a couple areas like right here, for example, where we can see a little bit of specs pop through, but where the primary issue is, is actually within this high pass layer. And so this is the layer we're gonna focus on. In another example, we'll talk about editing both layers. I have a third sort of example for that, but let's just talk about this layer for now. So uh, we've got those specs that are visible on this layer. We have our second layer with sort of the deeper color variation. We'll just hide that for now. And we'll work off of just this one layer. So this one layer, this is the one that has a linear light application that's being applied to the layer that's beneath it. Hence that when I view both of them, you can see that they look the same as the original. The main thing I wanna do is I wanna make sure that my second layer is hidden and I wanna make sure that my first layer, this high pass layer, is the one that I have highlighted. And you know it's highlighted because there's these blue lines that appear above and below it when I hover over it, okay? From there, I'm just gonna open up into the repair tool once again, and we're gonna only repair this layer. So because we've split it up uh, into a high pass and a low pass layer, um, we have a little less worry uh, in regards to this. We can sort of focus on just removing these and being a bit more, um, uh, I'm gonna use the word carefree, but a little bit less uh, refined. Refining is necessary in regards to this. So we'll just go through, and I think what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use a mixture of blended clone and smart erase on these. Smart erase for probably the ones where they interact with variations in, um, I guess, brightness. A good example of one that would be something that I would definitely use Smart Erase for would be this one, because you can see that it interacts with a different degree of brightness in the hair here, as well as the little, um, uh, the stuffies um, uh, ear here as well. Whereas these ones can just be blended clone because there's just a, a sort of a homogenous background there, right? So we'll go through and I'll just clean up a bunch of these just to sort of fix some of the background. Just go through and fix as much as I can. Definitely can fix that using blended clone. There we go. So forgive my speed here. I'm just gonna go through and fix as many as possible. Right clicking, oops. There we go, right clicking and left clicking wherever. 
There we go. Okay, let's have a look down here. So the, the fact that these don't have variations in um, too many variations in color has enabled me to sort of, I might smart erase on this one. As you can see, there's sort of a variation in lighting here. So I'll just click on it like that. Not bad. Oops. Go back into the blended clone tool, take out as much as I can, and then we'll focus on the face once we've sort of sufficiently uh, covered this area. It's not bad. Maybe I'll get rid of the spec down here and we'll look at the right side of my image here as well. Ooh, definitely want to get rid of these sock ones. So we'll use probably Smart Erase for this as well. Again, there's a lot of variation in color here. We'll just see how Smart Erase handles it. Not bad. Take this one out. Yep, nice. And then these I can probably use Blended Clone to get rid of. That looks like it's natural detail. Maybe zoom out a little bit. Ooh, get rid of this guy. Nice. And ooh, there's a couple grains in here and on the leg here as well. Take those out. There we go. And then these guys, I think what we can do is we can just take a bigger patch down here and apply it down up there and not worry about the space too much. And we'll also get rid of this one. There's a couple more in the background up here. We'll get rid of those and then we'll tackle the ones on the face and we'll have a look at the overall composition after these have been adjusted. It's not bad. That's pretty good. Let's focus on these three or four, I guess. So this one can just be blended clone, right? There's enough similarity in terms of the head there. This one, and I think the other three we'll use Smart Erase for, just see how it tackles these areas. This one's probably going to be the biggest problem. Yeah. Hmm. Let's try again with a bit of a thicker nib. So after control clicking, that's better, but I don't like the little pattern that leaves there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use blended clone to sort of blend out that little spot there. So combining the tools together here, and then we'll try again in this area with smart erase and see how it tackles this long line. Oof, not very good at all. Okay. We'll go a bit thicker. So the thickness does matter when it comes to uh, Smart Erase because again, it's informing it based on pixels that are sort of nearby. That's not bad. That's pretty good looking. Is there any other big spots? Maybe this chin part here would be a good to get rid of. And this one section, oops, that's not gonna work. There we go. Hmm. There we go. Ooh, no, I don't like the way that changed her chin. So we'll smart erase it instead. Mm, go a bit bigger. There we go. So there's our post smart erase and blended clone adjustments. Let's see how this looks in regards to the overall composition. We'll see if we need to do any blurring as well. So everybody can see that that is changed uh, based on this topical sort of um, uh, layer of, um, uh, what would be the word for it? Um, yeah, I guess the texture element in this. Dean asked, smart erase, does direction matter? It doesn't, no. The only thing that I changed there was the width of the, um, uh, the width of the nib when I went to select them. And the reason for that is because uh, if you don't get the result that you're looking for, at a thin sort of nib when you go to remove these elements, I would try increasing the nib width because it's the one of the few variables you can interact with because it's an, it's a, what would be the word for it? It's a automated process. Um, direction does matter for when cloning. Yeah, 100%. My, in an ideal world, one of the tools that I'd like to see added to this 
um, this tool or this uh, tool would be a, um, a, a direction changer, basically. So you could clone something and then you could rotate it. That would be something I'd love to see in a f future version of the product. But currently you can't rotate the direction. So you can only, uh, basically you'd have to maintain the, the sort of direction of your image. And that's why be very careful about where you clone or use blended, uh, blended clone because you still need to uh, sort of keep in mind other elements, right? Um, so <laughs> needless to say, here's the image, uh, what it looks like after these uh, effects have been changed, right? And I'll just, if we can, I'll just show the saved here. So this is the original. And then after the removal of that, there's certain elements I'd wanna maybe blur out. For example, this little spot here. Uh, but overall, all of those little textural elements have been removed from the image. And specifically the ones in relation to the the face, I think are the uh, the best that um, that I was able to get rid of here. Now, okay, important, right? So keep in mind that here's the shape of my image. And one of the reasons why using frequency separation is such a strong tool is because I'm maintaining the overall shape and sort of variation in uh, both saturation and brightness in the low pass layer. It's really just the high contrast areas that I'm adjusting using the high pass filter when I go to use frequency separation. And so when I said that you could, there's a little bit more room for um, making mistakes, it's because that that's still held within that low pass layer there. So that bottom layer, the quote unquote blurry layer that you see holds a lot of that information still. Um, whereas this high pass layer with sort of these textural elements that you see, I'm able to remove okay. Even in the areas where I might've changed a little bit of the chin shape or something like that, or some patterns on the bear here, it's still broadly held with this sort of blurry low pass layer here. And so that's one of the reasons why frequency separation is really user-friendly. Um, and I think just a really strong tool in general, because it allows you to sort of work off of these textural details or alternatively these blurred elements. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the next example that I have based on Della's question is will frequency separation help with a blurry original photo? I mean, keep in mind that if you have a blurry photo, you're going to struggle to increase the clarity of the image, right? Because you still need visual information to work off of. But how I can answer this question is I'm going to look at a different image here and we're going to talk about an area of my image that I want to address. The I want to actually blur. So I'm going to use frequency separation to do the blurring process and I'll show you what that looks like. So instead of looking at the high pass layer, we're now going to look at the low pass layer. I imagine we'll probably look at both, but just this is to emphasize the low pass layer. So here I have another photo, actually really nice contrast in this image. I got to say, this is a really beautiful image. Um, just a lot of visual detail in this and looks it looks great. However, there's some elements in my image on the right and left of my image where the subject is sort of um, uh, uh, superimposed in my image here that I, I don't love this. Like it kind of detracts from the subject matter, right? Same as this line that appears on the left and right hand corner here. So we're gonna blur these, right? We're gonna use the low pass layer to blur these. Uh, Tom said, in the previous image, there was still some stuff to fix as always. Would you do that on the other layer? Um, I might have. Uh, so the if it were if it was if you're looking at that image and you're like, oh, I really didn't like the detail sort of elements of it, that topical kind of film grainy kind of noise, you know, that would be high pass. In the low pass layer, what we can do is we can forcibly blur elements together, especially really useful if there's uh, water stains in your image, or if there's some variation in color that wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, this is also the case for uh, our image here. So I'll duplicate my image and I'm going to rename it and I'll go edits and I'll, let's go, um, let's go original and we'll sort of play around with um, frequency separation on this layer using the low pass layer. Here's our topical layer here and our low pass layer. 
so this is pretty cool. Um, everyone can hopefully see that this element here is more than textural. It also appears in the low pass layer. So we could blur our image, but it's going to address, or it's gonna change some of the frequency, high frequency elements in our image here. Uh, and as you can see, as I increase the frequency separation, oh, sorry, the uh, blur radius, some of the textural details are less visible in the high pass layer. So how I'm gonna address this, we'll just go with the standard right now. And instead of editing the uh, high pass layer for now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna forcibly blur this component in the low pass layer. So we have our low pass layer here highlighted instead of our high pass layer, okay? Hopefully everybody can see that. And instead of opening up the repair tool, I'll actually open up the blur tool. Blur is within the detail panel on the filter menu here. And if I click on blur, what it gives me the ability to do is do spot blurring with the brush tool. Uh, naturally, as you can see, if I was to just blur this image like this degree, um, actually, I'm really curious what this does to our final image. Let's just try it. Yeah, so a blur adjustment applied with just the frequency separation on its own, you know, completely ruins this image, let's be honest. So how we want to address this is we want to, after we've applied our frequency separation, we're going to blur our image, but we're going to blur only parts of the image by using the brush tool. Your original is on. What do you mean, Dean? The original layer appears at the very bottom and I'm not working off of my original layer. I'm working off my edited frequency separation layer. I keep my original in the layer panel just because, um, oh yeah, it being on, uh, doesn't matter right now. And I'll show you why, but that is a good point. Uh, and I'll, yeah, once I'm done blurring this, I'll show you why that's the case. Um, here's my, uh, my subject. The areas I want to blur are the outsides here. Let's just increase the feathering on our nib. Importantly, I've selected the brush edit brush. So this enables me to apply an adjustment that isn't universal. So apply it just to parts of my image. And then if I blur this section here, as you can see, then it sort of takes it out of my image on the sides here. Um, and then I can increase or decrease the Gaussian blur accordingly. I just wanna blur it to the extent they sort of disappear from view. And then I'll do the same on the left side of my image here as well. And that's, I think, all I'm going to do to this image. That's going to take out that textural component here. Once I've done blurring my image, I'll click Done. And you can see that when combined with our topmost layer here, these areas have been reduced of a lot of that um, here, I'll show the original here. Here's the original for, for reference. So this is with the blur and then the textural elements right here, which we're also gonna get rid of. So Dean asked, uh, my original layer is on. So that doesn't necessarily matter in this case because our edit layers appear above them. And even with this original layer uh, shown, basically uh, shown from in, in view here, turned on, displayed, You'll notice that my edits layer, the layer, the, the low pass layer that appears above it, also has a blend mode of normal. Uh, and what that blend mode means is it's just that all of the pixels are presented in this image. Uh, and so with it above the original layer, it's taking visual priority of uh, over the original. And so it's the one that's shown to us in this case, right? Now the rule is broken here with this topmost layer that has a blend mode. And so what a blend mode is, is it's a, it's a way of essentially blending this image with the image that appears directly beneath it, which in this case is our low pass layer. So why my original was on is because I knew that my base layer here, my uh, sort of low pass layer was also uh, on in my image basically and still um, visible. Does that make sense, Dean? Is there anything you don't understand about that? When it comes to priority of images, it goes top to bottom, basically. And so the only thing that changes that rule is if there is any blending 
or masking in our image. And masking is sort of not something we're talking about in this workshop, but blending certainly is. So last layer to talk about is this frequency separation layer. Uh, so the high pass layer, I'm just gonna do what I always do. I'm just gonna pull it into, oops, didn't mean to close that. I'm just gonna pull it into the repair tool. And I'll just quickly repair out those elements here. Uh, and that will sort of address the overall image. Um, let's just go through and blend these out. And blended clone makes sense because it makes holds on to those values, the pixel values, roughly speaking, and applies sort of a healing effect. There we go. And so when we look at our image now, what we're gonna see is, oops, I didn't mean to, there we go, dock that in, that part. What we're gonna see now is we've sort of removed those strong lines from our image, just to give you a reference. Here's our original image, and then here's our new image. I'd maybe wanna slightly crop out this corner here, but that appears in the original as well. Uh, but that's sort of like the removal process for these areas. And they were just like sort of blurring that into the image. The one thing I would maybe add to this workshop and something that's worth mentioning is that for images that contain a lot of noise, so noise is more than just damage in an image. Uh, damaged elements are things you're gonna wanna repair out. They're probably visually, uh, they're visible on your image, even at a zoomed out quality. Whereas noise is something that you might have to zoom in further and further to see. As you can see, as I zoom in, there's actually quite a substantial amount of noise on my image here. Um, and that's just like little specs that we wouldn't necessarily address in the repairing process. But what we could certainly do is address that in a um, with something called a noise removal. So I would go through and I would add noise reduction. And uh, with the noise reduction process, I would just smooth my image. And as you can see, I can smooth my image just by increasing the luminance meter on my noise reduction tool. The last thing I'd maybe do is to just to preserve a little bit of clarity, I would add a clarity la layer here, which is just gonna make my image detail pop a little bit more, even after this noise reduction process. I think what, noise, uh, what Tom said is super true. So um, noise is not necessarily something you need to remove in your image. Uh, I think smoothing your image might have a desired outcome in certain uh, images and look really uh, clean and clear uh, and really give it like a sort of an ethereal quality. But noise uh, is natural. And I think it's one of those things that you can certainly leave on an image as well and have it be justified in the space and look really, uh, give it a certain character to it. Um, more than character too, I would say that it also adds like just a degree of realism. Uh, but there's a difference between elements we want to repair out of our image. These elements are going to be dis disruptive. Um, I mean, the example that I gave earlier, right? Uh, here, let me just save this image as a edited file. Example. Oops, and then we can compare and contrast them as well. So when I save this as a uh, frequency separation uh, or sorry, when I save this as an ACDC file, this gives me the ability to go in and edit this image in the future, right? So not only do I have the original JPEG here, but I also have the uh, ACDC file that contains the adjustments in here. And so here's with everything considered, here's sort of a before and after of those two images. Um, yeah, and then like Dean said as well, noise is like the pop and hiss of a vinyl record, which, you know, has an appeal for for sure. Um, so there's my original ACDC file, uh, that I've saved here. And then I can go in and I can reopen this in the future and I can actually edit these values. Now, again, I can't truly edit these frequency separation layers because that element of it is destructive. Um, but what I can certainly do is I can go in and I can create a new frequency separation if I wanted to start the process over from my original layer or if I wanted to continue to make edits to these using the repair tool, even though I've already have 
essentially uh, edits to this layer. I can do that as well. I just got to know that every time I make an edit, it's like, uh, it's a destructive change. Um, so like when I said earlier, the file that I was working on previously, just briefly to this prior to this workshop is I was looking at this other image and sort of, this is a really egregious example rather, uh, I think of an image that would require an intense amount of <laughs> adjustments to, to, to change, but I'm sort of slowly going through this image and I'm making adjustments to it. There's certain things that are, um, I think that are fundamentally changing this, uh, this image, but there's ways to address these things and slowly go through and, and use frequency separation in combination with the repair tool and also with the blur function to get some really amazing corrections on your images, you know? And this, I think I wanted to give as an example because the, just the change to the image was so severe. Um, Lem asked, can you change the pixels? It does look like Frank Zappa, doesn't it? Uh, he's got the same mustache and, uh, and uh, was it called a uh, soul patch? Uh, Lem asked, can you change the pixel size of tool? Which tool are you referring to, Lem? Are, are you referring to the re the repair tool or are you referring to the frequency separation or maybe the blur component? I just want to have a better understanding of what part because the repair tool, certainly you can change the pixel size. Same with the blur. Uh, the frequency separation is a universal application. So the only thing you have control over is that little slider that appears when you're in the tool there. Uh, Philip asked, how does the noise reduction in edit compared to other dedicated apps? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, noise reduction has been one of those tools that has seen a lot of change over the last couple of years. Thank you, Luis. Take care. Uh, and um, it, in regards to ACDC, they've added a lot of functionality and control in the tool. Uh, I would say it's a it's a very good tool from a noise reduction perspective. I remember the first time that we had made adjustments to the the tool, or the developers had made adjustments to the tool, and it it was met with a, like a lot of uh, praise in in ACDC. But for a tool that just does noise removal, I mean, I'd have to use it. I I don't know. I would say that for a tool that's entire dedicated purpose is noise removal, you might find that those tools are like superior, but. I, I don't actually know. I'd have to like try them both to, to check them out. Uh, Lem asked again, repair tool when doing a background can be tedious with small tool. Yep, for sure. Yeah, it's a uh, manual adjustment. Manuals adjustments take time. Yeah. So you can certainly increase the size of the, um, of the, the, the process, right? Um, when we're in the repair, or sorry, when we're in the repair tool, right? I can increase the uh, size of a of the the nib, right? When I'm in my blended clone function, I can also reduce the size of it. But these are labor intensive processes, Lem. Like this is going to require a bit of investment and like you know to change an image to repair an image. Like um, automated processes are not going to repair your image ideally in all situations. And they're also going to result in sort of like visual errors. So the reason why we do, or I'm sort of showcasing this and using frequency separation to illustrate these changes is to showcase that we can make manual adjustments to these images and have control over the degree or the severity of those applications. So to showcase with frequency separation is to showcase a tool that is very user-friendly and will allow you to make adjustments to your image without like completely ruining it or changing the structure of the image or having uh, outcomes that are often uh, maybe a little bit more uncontrollable when it comes to the cloning process. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, all manual adjustments are gonna require skill and time to adjust, you know? And so a big portion of what I do is to just showcase people more effective ways of using those processes. Uh, so we talk about selections a lot. And I think Rodrigo's got a workshop on manual selections coming up soon. One of the things that another user had requested, and I'm going to schedule today, is a workshop on using advanced masking tools. So we're going to talk about all the different ways to mask images uh, and images, uh, you know, from automated functions to 
uh, like a really intense selection process is. And so I'm going to be booking that one uh, for probably later on in March, but yeah. Uh, let's have some look at some of these questions before we get going here. Philip said, good answer. Thank for this very well prepared webinar. You're so welcome. Susan asked, wonderful. Thank you for looking forward to using these tools. I'm, I'm so glad that they make sense. Uh, Zvi said, thank you. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Uh, Laurent said, very interesting as usual. Thank you, Adam. You're so welcome. Uh, Bob said, uh, I have now a pen and a tablet. Can I get advantage of that hardware? Yeah, I think ACDC does have tablet functionality. Uh, I'm afraid that's way beyond my uh, level of understanding, but I'm pretty sure you can use the help window and look up tablet to find out more on how to set that up properly. Um, let me see, tablet, zero rights. I'd have to, or you know what? Shoot me a message over the um, the community portal and I'll get back to you on that because I know that there was additions to that. Uh, wonderful, you're so welcome, Dilla. Um, Rick, you're so welcome. Norman, you're so welcome again. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to schedule some workshops today. I'm also going to save this workshop and upload it to our YouTube channel so that you can watch it there. They're generally up uh, within the next couple of days after the workshop themselves. I really appreciate everyone sticking around and watching this workshop today. One of my favorite topics is like photo restorations. I find them really fascinating. If you want to see more on this topic or if you want me to cover a specific thing, message me. I want to make workshops for you guys um, that you want to see. And I can do most things in ACDC. Like I said, I'm a uh, graphic designer um, and sort of like a photo artist by trade, but I absolutely can use ACDC to do some pretty cool things. So if there's anything you want me to cover, just message me. I'm always looking for those ideas. That really matters to me. So, yep, you can color as a black and white photo for sure. <laughs> if you want to see that workshop, I'll schedule it. Um, it's has to be done manually. There's colorization tools online that do good approximate um, sort of automated processes. But in ACDC, we would have to do it by hand basically to do it manually. Definitely can talk about that. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Bram. Uh, why does the Smart Erase tool stay active after I exit from the repair mo mode? Why does the Smart Erase tool stay active after I exit from the repair tool? Oh, like it's turned on? Uh, that's a good question. That might be as simple as when you opened it up in the repair tool, it sort of treats it. Oh, that's interesting. That might even be a bug actually, that it's automatically open. Hmm. I'm going to bring that up with the developers. I don't think that's a great, that might be, that might be as simple as it being a, a, a bug that we just discovered. Cause I would I, ideally like it to be like the hand tool or something like that, like a default neutral tool. Cause you don't want to click on your image accidentally and repair it. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, let me bring that up with the developers. That might be just a um, like a uh, an unreported bug. Is the smart erase tool for taking out wires and photos? Yep, absolutely. That is something it can do. Uh, it's actually really useful for any a lot of edits. But I think thin objects like wires is absolutely what it excels at it's also very good for taking out stray hairs in photos uh, and as we've talked about in this workshop too it's useful for a variety of different repair functions super powerful tool katrina said thank you this is very helpful i'm new to acdc and i'm excited to learn how to use these tools better i used to do photo editing mostly in paint.net this is an upgrade i'm glad to hear that's an upgrade there's so many tools in acdc it's a huge like very very developed product with like, you know, several decades of history to it. So there's a lot of tools. And ultimately my goal is to just make some of these tools a bit more understood. Uh, and so you can get, uh, so A, so you can work with the tools, develop your own strategies and workflows with them. Carolyn, you're so welcome. Thank you. Um, also, it's nice to have the, re the request to speak a bit slower today. I find that I have a tendency to speed up uh, naturally as the workshop goes through. I'm trying my best to make this a good workshop experience for even English, um, if English is a person's second language. 
thank you so much. I wish I understood how to <laughs> pronounce your name, but thank you to the the Cyrillic uh, person there. I appreciate that. Uh, Bram, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, Dean, yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it for today, folks. Um, I'll probably answer any more questions that'll pop up in the Q&A panel. So if you have any questions, ask them there. Uh, but that is the workshop today. It's it's officially done. I'll upload it in uh, as soon as I can. Uh, please message me if you have any workshop requests. Happy to cover whatever you want to request. No request is too small or too big. Truly know that. Um, well, maybe there's certain requests that are too big, but there's certainly no request that's too small. <laughs> so you know, message me if that's the case. Um, it, there are certain things that are more conducive to a tutorial and there's certain things that are more conducive to a workshop. But uh, even if you really want to see a specific way of doing something, I'll do my best to make it into one of those two things. Um, yeah, but anyway, the workshop is officially over. If anyone has any more questions, just shoot them and I'll answer them as, but yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day and thanks for so much for participating. Otto has a question. One other request. I have a venue I frequent for a lot of music. Cool. However, they always have red lights as a main lighting. So all my photos are washed out in red. When you say washed out, uh, do you mean that they have like, when you say washed out, do you mean that they are, that it's like white? It appears white in your images, auto or red overtone. Okay. Okay. Uh, so if your images appear overly red, uh, the tool that I would recommend to try first before anything else would be to, uh, this is a bad example, but it's pretty pink as you can see. But basically what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna open up something called white balance. And so what you wanna do is images that appear too red, you're gonna wanna adjust the tint. So what you would do is you move the tint further to a green spectrum and further to a maybe a blue spectrum. And what that's going to do is it's going to essentially uh, positively correct your image by sort of adding those values. Um, that would be my first suggestion. This is sort of a very simple way of adjusting this. Um, if this doesn't uh, help your image, I'd be curious for you to send me like a venue photo because it might be something that would be a good, I might play around with it uh, if you're comfortable with me uh, editing your image and I might use it as a case study for a future workshop. I can't promise anything because I got to be able to check to see if I can even edit it myself, but I would try using white balance uh, first uh, and then, um, and then maybe, uh, yeah, like I said, maybe send me an image if you don't, if, if you don't get positive results from that. Uh, and then I would maybe play around with it myself, you know, to sort of, uh, see what I can do. Um, yeah, but that's the classic means of adjusting the white balance, right? Because if your image is too red, uh, you can go through and you can sort of adjust that based on using the temperature controls. I need to send you a photo. I've tried white balance. Okay, just shoot it to me over the 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 community portal. The same way that you found this workshop, uh, you'll see my like you you'll, you'll find me in the uh, like I'm the person who hosts the workshops. So you should be able to click on my name and just uh, just send me a private message there. Uh, yeah, and like I said, can't promise anything that I can do to it, but I'll certainly have a look, and it might be a good topic for a future workshop. So, yeah, you're welcome, Otto. Great question. Uh, difference between YouTube video versus YouTube, ACDC community videos. Um, so we upload all of our videos to YouTube. There's basically two types of videos we upload. We upload short tutorials. Rodrigo's been doing some more shorts as well. Shorts are like under, under a minute in length and they're typically highly edited. Tutorials are a little less edited. They're like, they sort of zoom into certain tools and show you how to do certain things. They generally run about five minutes. And then workshop uploads are literally that. They're just an upload of the workshop video themselves. They run uh, generally about one to two hours in length. Um, 
we cut off the header and footer when we're just chatting at the beginning and often I'll cut out a good portion of the chatting at the end uh, so that it's mostly just the workshop itself. But it's just so that people have a reference that they can rewatch the workshop because we often cover a lot in workshops and people want to see them again. So that's where we upload. Those are the three things that we generally cover on um, our YouTube. So we have short tutorials that are underneath a minute. Then we have like full length tutorials that are about five minutes approximately. And then we have workshop videos. We also will do once a year, we'll do a huge video that runs generally about 10 minute tutorial length, length video that talks about new tools that are in the most recent version of ACDC. So as ACDC releases a new version, we'll talk about every single tool that uh, does visual adjustments to an images in the, and you know, so when 2025 products rolls around, we'll have a workshop for that or a tutorial for that. Does that answer your question, Chuck? I don't know if it does, but Stella asked, open eyes of people with eyes closed during shot as well as licking their lips on the photo. Uh, you would need a reference photo for both of those things. So you'd need to copy an element from one photo, essentially move it over to another photo. That route would require you to edit the image in edit mode. It would require a lot of masking. That's really cool of an idea. I would request if someone wants a workshop of that, I would request them to send me photos because it's really hard to find stock photography of like a good example of those. But uh, if possible, I could do a workshop on something like that. Yeah, that's a really cool topic. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something you'd need to use masking for. Um, another one, I, I would just basically request consent from whoever sent me the photos that that was okay to use those to discuss the topic. But it's just going to be really hard to find uh, stock photography photos of like a before and after image, one with a image with, with people who have eyes closed and another with an image with them with their eyes open. Because certain times you'll want, oh, this image is really good. Everyone looks really good in this image except for Aunt Grace. And Aunt Grace has her eyes closed and her tongue sticking out for some reason. Yeah, you could look at it with um, that masking. It might work. Uh, it might look okay. Um, best case scenario is you take the best photo and, you know, and it has, has uh, those issues already resolved, but some masking challenges could be addressed by, yeah, by using, uh, sorry, cer certain image uh, combination images can be addressed by using masking. Okay. Let's see if you can, let me see if I can open the community. One sec. I'll find this. Do, do, do. So I also don't have this from the perspective of most of the members here. So let's see. Do, do, do.